Every time there's an attack, all the clues and details and the inconsistencies, they paint a picture that's again and again denied by the system, and the very idea of hinting at a conspiracy or a false flag event is ridiculed and laughed off and considered to be ridiculous. And yet this has happened time and time again in history. Most of it isn't documented, but there are certain cases where it was explicitly stated, and one of those places is with Operation Northwoods. So we thought we would look at this document for Operation Northwoods. It was declassified because the problem with people forgetting history or failing to research history or failing to look into history is they forget these things ever happened, and then history continues to repeat, and people act like they have no idea why. I hear debunkers all the time when these major false flags happen. They make these arguments like, how could large numbers of people lie about their identity? How could there be large numbers of crisis actors? How could they have fake funerals with fake victims? How could any of that stuff ever happen? How could so many people keep a secret? Exactly. And you hear that over and over and over every time there's a major event that has all the hallmarks of being a false flag. Well, if you go back and look at this particular document, they outline all of this stuff in print. How could those things happen? Well, just ask the Joint Chiefs of Staff after their meeting in March 1962, where they laid out exactly how it could happen, all in print, right there. It should be damning. It should be enough to shut this stuff down. But not enough people seem to know about it. And we just thought, I know a lot of people have are familiar with this document. A lot of people have seen it. But if you haven't seen it in a while or you've never seen it, we thought this was a perfect time to go back and really analyze this document thoroughly. I'm going to leave a link in the description so that you guys can go download it and look at it for yourselves. But I think when you look back at some of the things that have happened over the last 20 years especially, and then you reread this document or read it for the first time, a lot of things are going to start to make sense. This is the memorandum for the Secretary of Defense dated 13 March 1962, subject, Justification for U.S. Military Intervention in Cuba, T.S., I guess, top secret. It says, number one, the Joint Chiefs of Staff have considered the attached memorandum for the Chief of Operations Cuba Project, which responds to a request of that office for brief but precise description of pretexts which would provide justification for U.S. military intervention in Cuba. He just launched an invasion on a small country. Yes, but he was justified. <laughs> Number two, the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommend that the proposed memorandum be forwarded as a preliminary submission suitable for planning purposes. It is assumed, by the way, that there will be similar submissions from other agencies. So this isn't just the Joint Chiefs, this is agencies, plural. And that these inputs will be used as a basis for developing a time-phased plan. Sounds very serious. And then it says, It is recommended this responsibility for both overt and covert military operations be assigned the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And then it's signed by Limnitzer. Then it goes on to say, Note by the Secretaries to the Joint Chiefs of Staff on Northwoods, a report on the above subject is submitted for consideration by Joint Chiefs. So this is their report. Then you have this document that's been attached, which is a very poor photocopy. They always do that, especially on things where they really don't want people to actually read it. Like they couldn't make another photocopy that you can actually, that's actually legible. It's kind of ridiculous. But what this says is that, number one, this is note by the secretaries. Number one, at their meeting on 13 March 1962, the Joint Chiefs of Staff approved the recommendations in paragraph 8 of JCS 1969-321. But so they approved the recommendations in paragraph 8. So they were moving forward with this. And then they've got something down here totally blacked out that they don't want you to see even now. Then it goes on to say, this is a report by the Department of Defense and Joint Chiefs of Staff representative on the Caribbean Survey Group. If you just heard the, the name Caribbean Survey Group, you wouldn't even think twice about what that means. To the Joint Chiefs of Staff on Cuba Project Top Secret. This one is dated 9 March 1962, just a couple days before. So they were moving pretty fast as far as the government's concerned on this. Now it's going to identify the problem, quote unquote. As requested by Chief of Operations Cuba Project, the Joint Chiefs of Staff are to indicate brief but precise description of pretexts which they consider would provide justification for U.S. military intervention in Cuba. 
and there's an asterisk down here and it says memorandum for general craig from chief of operations cuba project Sub subject operation mongoose dated 5 march 1962 which is on file and Operation Mongoose was a plan to infiltrate and foster rebellion against Cuba and ultimately to overthrow the government and establish a new one. So it was everything from sabotage on up that they could utilize. And this is in classic Hegelian dialectic fashion. It's problem, reaction, solution in a textbook format. They openly tell you what conclusion they want to reach, the justification for war with Cuba, and they're looking for a reason. They're looking for the pretext that will make that justifiable, some sort of event. A lot of these pages in the middle are just repeating the general idea of they want justification for intervention, they need to come up with a plan, this is the way they're going to do it, and they repeat a lot of stuff over and over. So I'm just going to skip forward to the meat of the document, which is Appendix A. This, and this, if you haven't seen it yet, it will blow your mind that they put this in print. And it will make you question... For all the things that have happened since then, how many documents like this have they yet to declassify that are laying out things that have happened? And a lot of the things that are in this appendix, very similar things have happened. And it definitely makes you wonder. It starts out with a parenthetical about how the courses of action which follow are preliminary submission suitable for planning purposes. They are arranged neither chronologically nor in ascending order. And then it goes on to repeat that this is going to be part of their single integrated time phase plan for justification, blah, blah, blah. Number one, since it would seem desirable to use legitimate provocation as the basis for U.S. military intervention, not that I'm really sure that any of this is legitimate, but whatever, in Cuba, a cover and deception plan to include requisite preliminary actions such as has been developed in response to Task 33C could be executed as an initial effort to provoke Cuban reactions. Harassment plus deceptive actions to convince the Cubans of imminent invasion would be emphasized. Our military posture throughout execution of the plan will allow a rapid change from exercise to intervention if Cuban response justifies. So that sounds a lot to me like going from a drill to live. And this is the military and the government admitting how deceptive they are about these events. Time and again, there's calls to patriotism. There's accusations for anyone who dares to question events. And there's false logical fallacies put forward to obscure any debates and questions. But this is a government practicing deception. How can they not be questioned? Then it goes on to say, A series of well-coordinated incidents will be planned to take place in and around Guantanamo to give genuine appearance of being done by hostile Cuban forces. Because nobody's out there who's going to know except the people that are all in on it. And then it says, A, incidents to establish a credible attack. I think they should have put credible in quotes, don't you? Not in chronological order. One, start rumors. Many, use clandestine radio. So there's your propaganda. Number two, land friendly Cubans in uniform, quote, over the fence, end quote, to stage an attack on the base. Capture friendly Cuban saboteurs. And start riots near the base main gate with friendly Cubans. All of these being friendly Cubans, you could substitute crisis actors, you could substitute CIA contractors, but the point is, it's not legitimate. It's again not real. Again and again and again. Blow up ammunition inside the base, start fires, burn aircraft on airbase, sabotage. Lob mortar shells from outside of base into base, some damage to installations. Capture assault teams approaching from the sea or vicinity of Guantanamo City. Capture militia group which storms the base. Sabotage a ship in the harbor. Large fires, naphthalene. Sink ship near harbor entrance. Conduct funerals for mock victims may be in lieu of 10. So all those people who say they would never do that with the fake victims and I know someone who knows someone whose mailman's grandma's cousin's friend of a friend's brother's teacher's neighbor's pet's friend was down there and so it definitely happened. Let me just point you out to number 11 here where they talk about conducting funerals for fake victims. That's what they say right here in print that they would do. So therefore, how can we not question it? If something, if something doesn't look right and doesn't pass the sniff test, why are we supposed to take away our own logic, 
our own critical thought process, our own brain, and just throw that out the window and replace it with official narratives and mainstream media propaganda. Why when, would anyone be okay with them playing with our heartstrings and to- toying with our emotions? Exactly. It says it right there. Then it goes on to say, United States would respond by executing offensive operations to secure water and power supplies, destroying artillery and mortar emplacements which threaten the base. C. Commence large-scale United States military operations. Then it goes on to say, number three, a quote-unquote remember the main incident could be arranged in several forms. And of course, the main was the ship that was sunk in Cuba back in 1898, and it was pretty clearly a provocated fake event. But it was used to sell the public on the U.S.-Spain war, the Spanish war over Cuba. It was used to blame Maine. And William Randolph Hearst and others basically dreamed this thing up and sold it in the papers through false pictures and false stories. And they go on to say they could blow up a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay and blame Cuba. When have we ever heard of them using an attack on a ship as a provocation and justification for war? Gee, I don't know. Vietnam, anybody? Lusitania, World War I. It happens over and over again. The they, USS Cole with Osama bin Laden before the 9-11 attacks. Over and over again. And then it says, we could blow up a drone vessel, an unmanned drone vessel, anywhere in Cuban waters We could arrange to cause such incident in the vicinity of Havana or Santiago as a spectacular result of Cuban attack from the air or sea or both. The presence of Cuban planes or ships merely investigating the intent of the vessel could be fairly compelling evidence that the ship was taken under attack. The nearness to Havana or Santiago would add credibility especially to those people that might have heard the blast or have seen the fire. The U.S. could follow up with an air-sea rescue operation covered by U.S. fighters to quote-unquote evacuate remaining members of the non-existent crew. So they're going to tell everyone that they attacked people, soldiers, our soldiers, the ones that they always walk all over. They're going to make it seem like a lot of them were harmed when they didn't even exist. They're not real. Well, and how different is an exercise to practice for the eventuality from pretending that our search and rescue is taking place after a fake or provocated event? But they're going to take it a step further by placing casualty lists in U.S. newspapers to cause a helpful wave of national indignation. So they're going to print the names of the non-existent dead soldiers from the drone ship that was fake attacked outside of Cuba. To toy with emotions and get the American public on their side. Then it goes on to say they could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, other Florida cities, or even in Washington. The terror campaign could be pointed at Cuban refugees seeking haven in the United States. We could sink a boatload of Cubans en route to Florida, real or simulated. They don't care if it's real human beings they're murdering. They don't. So hoax or no hoax, they don't, they'll kill people or not. Whatever, whatever you want. We could foster attempts on lives of Cuban refugees in the United States, even to the extent of wounding in instances to be widely publicized. Exploding a few plastic bombs in carefully chosen spots, the arrest of Cuban agents and the release of prepared documents substantiating Cuban involvement also would be helpful in projecting the idea of an irresponsible government. They're going to set off plastic bombs. They're going to foster attempts on lives. They're going to sink boatloads of people real or simulated. And this whole contrived terror campaign was carried out with the help of NATO in Europe under Operation Gladio. This was done (laughs) to neutralize their opposition. (sighs) Then it goes on to say, a Cuban-based Castro-supported, quote, end quote, filibuster could be simulated against a neighboring Caribbean nation in the vein of the 14th of June invasion of the Dominican Republic. We know that Castro is backing subversive efforts clandestinely against Haiti, Dominican Republic, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. I'm pretty sure a few of those also had CIA coups, but whatever, at present and possible others. These efforts can be magnified and additional ones contrived for exposure. Contrived for exposure. Contrived for exposure. By Calvin Klein. Contrived for exposure, starring the dictator of this episode. It sounds like a the lifetime days of our lives. I know. It sounds like a lifetime network movie starring Dick Cheney. How many eyes take this stuff for granted and believe what they're told on the news 
when they're admitting that they contrive these events for exposure so that the mm-hmm. public can see them. And then it says, for example, advantage can be taken of the sensitivity of the Dominican Air Force to intrusions within their airspace. Quote, unquote, Cuban B-26 or C-46 type aircraft could be could make cane burning raids at night. Soviet bloc incendiaries could be found. This could be coupled with, quote, unquote, Cuban messages to the communist underground in the Dominican Republic and, quote, unquote, Cuban shipments of arms, which would be found or intercepted on the beach. That sounds pretty familiar to me, too. And it goes on to say, use of MiG-type aircraft by U.S. pilots could provide additional provocation, harassment of civil air, attacks on surface shipping, and destruction of U.S. military drone aircraft by MiG-type planes would be useful as complementary actions. An F-86 properly painted would convince air passengers they saw a Cuban MiG, especially if the pilot of the transport were to announce such fact. So... You'll believe it because they told you to, not because that's what you're really even seeing. The primary drawback to this suggestion appears to be the security risk inherent in obtaining or modifying an aircraft. But it goes on to say, however, reasonable copies of the MiG could be produced from U.S. sources in about three months through their defense contractors. It gets worse. Number seven, hijacking attempts against civil air and surface craft should appear to continue as harassing measures condoned by the government of Cuba. Concurrently, genuine defections of Cuban civil and military air and surface craft should be encouraged. This one, I think, though, number eight, really does take the crap cake. It says it is possible to create an incident which will demonstrate convincingly that a Cuban aircraft has attacked and shot down a chartered civil airliner en route from the United States to Jamaica, Guatemala, Panama, or Venezuela. The destination would be chosen only to cause the flight plan route to cross Cuba. The passengers could be a group of college students off on a holiday or any grouping of persons with a common interest to support chartering a non-scheduled flight. But (laughs) this is what really would happen. An aircraft at Eglin Air Force Base would be painted and numbered as an exact duplicate for a civil registered aircraft belonging to a CIA proprietary organization in the Miami area. At a designated time, the duplicate would be substituted for the actual civil aircraft and would be loaded with the selected passengers who are all boarded under carefully prepared aliases. Fake passengers. The actual registered aircraft would be converted to a drone. So they can convert commercial airliners into drones. Just by the way, for anyone not paying attention for the last, I don't know, 16 years. B. Takeoff times of the drone aircraft and the actual aircraft will be scheduled to allow a rendezvous south of Florida. From the rendezvous point, the passenger carrying aircraft will descend to minimum altitude and go directly into an auxiliary field at Eglin Air Force Base where arrangements will have been made to evacuate all the passengers and return the aircraft to its original status. So the other aircraft will disappear. The drone aircraft, meanwhile, will continue to fly the filed flight plan. When over Cuba, the drone will be when over Cuba, the drone will begin transmitting on the international distress frequency a mayday message stating he is under attack by Cuban MiG aircraft. The transmission will be interrupted by destruction of the aircraft, which will be triggered by radio signal. This will allow the ICAO radio stations in the Western Hemisphere to tell the U.S. what has happened to the aircraft instead of the U.S. trying to sell the incident. This will answer the questions, how could they make cell phone calls from 30,000 feet on a hijacked plane? Exactly. How could so many people be in on it? How could they? How could they keep a secret? How? I just, I can't imagine it, but the Joint Chiefs of Staff can, because they did right here, okay? And that is how a whole plane full of victims is actually a plane full of non-existent fake passengers with aliases who... They, f- they just fly below radar to a air- an Air Force base somewhere. They unload those people, and the drone continues on and takes the place. And that's and Why are they dumping fake passports at the crash site? Oh, it's a guy with a whole bunch of passports. What is he doing with them? Oh, he's scattering them all over the ground. Why? Why is he scattering a bunch of passports from the Netherlands all over the ground? The Netherlands, where a bunch of the people that were supposedly killed on this flight were coming from. How, how are planes just disappearing passport, out of the sky? I have no idea. How did these passports survive the explosion on the towers? Hmm. Why are they all intact if they were in this crash? Oh, the first one they got is a little girl. 
and a little boy. Explain to me what is going on here, because I really don't understand it. It's the same video they're showing in the background here as the Prime Minister is speaking. There it is, up there in the corner. See? They showed it. Number nine. It is possible to create an incident which will make it appear that communist Cuban MiGs have destroyed a U.S. Air Force aircraft over international waters in an unprovoked attack. A. Approximately four or five F-101 aircraft will be dispatched and trail from Homestead Air Force Base, Florida, to the vicinity of Cuba. Their mission will be to reverse course and simulate secure aircraft for an air defense exercise in southern Florida. These aircraft would conduct variations of these flights at frequent intervals. Crews would be briefed to remain at least 12 miles off the Cuban coast. However, they would be required to carry live ammunition in the event that hostile actions were taken by Cuban MiGs. B. On one such flight... A pre-briefed pilot would fly tail in Charlie at considerable interval between aircraft. While near the Cuban island, this pilot would broadcast that he had been jumped by MiGs and was going down. No other calls would be made. The pilot would then fly directly west at extremely low altitude and land at a secure base, an Eglin Auxiliary. The aircraft would be met by proper people, quickly stored, and given a new tail number. Now that plane no longer exists. The pilot who performed the mission under an alias would resume his proper identity and returned to his normal place of business. The pilot and the aircraft would have then disappeared altogether off the face of the planet. Mm. Neither one exists. Then, at precisely the same time that the aircraft was presumably shot down, a submarine or small surface craft would disperse F-101 parts, a parachute, etc., 15 to 20 miles off the Cuban coast, and depart. The pilots returning to Homestead would have a true story as far as they knew. Search ships and aircraft could be dispatched and parts of the aircraft found. This is a pro-Russian separatist standing on a piece of this plane, which just so happens to be intact enough to show you that it is a Malaysian Airlines flight because that's their logo. And that picture's been floated around everywhere. And there's even this tweet of kids supposedly standing on another piece of wreckage. But these pieces look inconsistent with all the other photos we've seen in this crash site. Yeah, does that look anything to you like this? Which is what all of the mainstream media outlets are showing everyone. You've got all this explosion everywhere and you can't hardly see anything. These two things look like movie sets and they don't reconcile with each other. History repeats again and again because people continue to believe it. And then it also has this Enclosure B facts bearing on the problem. And it says they've previously stated that U.S. unilateral military intervention in Cuba can be undertaken in the event the Cuban regime commits hostile acts against U.S. forces or property, which would serve as an incident upon which to base overt intervention. The need for positive action in the event that their current covert efforts to foster an internal Cuban rebellion are unsuccessful which was indicated by Joint Chiefs of Staff on 7 March 62 as follows, determination that a credible internal revolt is impossible of attainment during the next 9 to 10 months will require a decision by the United States to develop a Cuban provocation as justification for positive U.S. military action. So they were covertly fostering an internal Cuban rebellion, but if it didn't work in 9 to 10 months, they were going to have to do something else. It is understood that the Department of State also is preparing suggested courses of action to develop justification for U.S. military intervention in Cuba. Because that is what the Department of State is all about. That's why the Department of State exists. So, this is the document right here. And all of those people who want to debunk false flags all the time and act like you're a crazy tinfoil hatter, if you would even dare to begin to question the official story. This is why people question the official story. You and I are not supposed to question this, but they've institutionalized a playbook of deception, fake airplanes, fake passengers, mock funeral victims, stage sabotage, staged riots, and more. It's a stacking of the deck, people. I would love to live in a world where you get up in the morning and whatever's on the news... That's just a, a straight retelling of things that are actually happening and that we don't live in a country where they've legalized the use of propaganda against the American citizens and you can't take anything you're being told at face value because there's so many layers upon layers upon layers of deception with this stuff. But this document right here I feel like is key because it is the closest that you get to seeing how far they would go how many people they could get to be involved in such a level of deception and how little they actually care 
for human life. And the funerals and the victims, yeah, they will make up funerals. They will make up victims. They will make up explosions. They will make things up. They will lie. So the next time somebody acts outraged that you could possibly question whether a major event that they're pushing in your face 24 hours a day, seven days a week, while threatening to take away civil liberties, while threatening to to consolidate more power, while threatening to turn this place into an even bigger police state than it is, just point them to this document, download it, print it off and hand them a copy. Say, here's a little light reading for lunch. Because I don't think anybody should even get mad for asking questions until they've properly educated themselves on why anybody would ask a question in the first place.